Welcome to the Tepper School of Business Multimedia Series. For more information on the Tepper School at Carnegie Mellon, please visit us at www.tepper.cmu.edu slash multimedia. And now, here's your selected video. My name is Gabriel Santernas. I'm the president of the Energy Club here at the Tepper School. Uh, on behalf of all of us today, I have the honor to introduce our guest speaker for today, Ted Kraber. Mr. Ted Kraber is the chairman, president, and CEO of Edison International, which is a parent company of Southern, Interna uh, Southern California Edison, one of the largest uh, electric utilities of the country. Prior to his tenure with uh, Edison International, Mr. Kraber spent a lot of time in the banking industry, and he developed some roles like capital markets, social trading, and corporate development. Actually, 23 years he was working on this industry. Uh, in 2014, he was named CEO of the uh, large utility CEO of the year by the. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, too many things to remember. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Electric Light and Power Magazine. Um, he's also a board member of several organizations, actually. Uh, one of some of them are HealthNet, the Nature Conservancy, um, Autry National Center, and the uh, Smithsonian uh, Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Uh, he's also a prior board member of the Electric Power Research Institute and the Edison Electric Institute. Uh, also, but it's done, but it goes, but it goes on. He's also a member of the Business Roundtable and the Economic Advisory Council of the Federal Reserve Bank 12th District. Mr. Kraber, he got his MBA and his uh, bachelor's degree in Economic and International Policies at the University of Southern California. So please join me in giving him a very warm welcome to the Federal School of Economy. Thank you. <laughs> Well, Gabriel, thanks very much. It's uh, never easy to do one of those things, but uh, I appreciate it. Uh, a nice warm welcome from all of you. Uh, I think probably several of you at least know that uh, uh, Jay Apt was on the board of EPRI uh, when I was on the board of EPRI as well and uh, got to know each other. Uh, I've always been impressed with, uh, with Jay's ability to take kind of complex things and yet make them understandable and, and simple for simple minds like this. Uh, we had a lot of fun uh, working on some of the issues uh, that were really facing the electric power industry uh, during the time when we were both on the board. Uh, I have to admit, I, I didn't know before that you got your PhD from MIT and what was it, experimental nuclear physics or something along that line? Uh, yeah, so now I really feel uh, uh, that I've got, I've got to run fast in order to uh, even come close to where uh, Jay is. But uh, I wanted to uh, kind of cover a couple of things that I think are kind of central to what's taking place in our, our industry. Uh, and at the end, uh, kind of in the spirit of, uh, of learning, I'm going to identify five or six things that I think are... Uh, kind of problems that we're grappling with, ones that are pretty constantly on my mind. Uh, I don't have answers to them. Uh, you all might have some answers to them, which would be helpful. Uh, but these are the things I think are really going to be uh, challenging us for the next uh, several years going forward. Uh, one little story. Um, I didn't know before uh, I came here that uh, the business school was named after David Tepper. Uh, and I have a little experience with uh, David in the early days uh, of my career at Edison. Uh, we had a subsidiary that, uh, let's just say, was being challenged. Uh, so the bonds went from trading at uh, 106, 107, to trading at 90, to trading at 80, to trading at 70 cents on the dollar. And that's usually about the time David gets excited. Uh, when they got down to 50 cents on the dollar, he jumped in big and bought them all the way down to about 20 cents on the dollar. Uh, and there was a, uh, at least for me, a rather a poignant event. I got a call from David. Uh, he was uh, with Appaloosa, had, had, uh, heading up Appaloosa. He said, uh, so Ted, I got a couple ideas. I'd like to sit down and talk to you. I said, 
fine, uh, let me talk to my 82 lawyers and see if I'm uh, allowed to talk to you. Uh, <laughs> but uh, long story short, uh, he invited me to uh, this little bar type place at the top of the Peninsula Hotel in New York City. And he was very excited about the two bottles of wine that he brought from his own collection. And uh, we sat down and in uh, kind of classic David style, um, it took him about three minutes to explain uh, these are the things you need to do to fix this problem. If you don't fix this problem, we'll just buy your company. And uh, we went through that little exercise. As it turned out, we did several, not all, but several of those things. And uh, we, made, uh, we made David very wealthy. That might have been why he <laughs> came here and uh, <clears throat> he owned a lot of bonds at really cheap prices and uh, they all recovered to above 100 cents on the dollar. So that's my David Tepper story. Um, You know, I think it's important if you're ever going to listen to somebody uh, talk about the future or talk about what they think should be done or the issues that you know a little bit about where they're coming from so you can kind of sort out their biases. I guarantee you I have biases. I have several of them. Uh, and they're probably, like everyone, they're born of uh, the fact that uh, we're all products of our history. Uh, I have an economics background. Uh, I've been involved with markets, capital markets, for uh, many years in the banking industry. So I very much believe in capitalism. I very much believe in markets. I very much believe in the ability for free enterprise to uh, solve some of the toughest problems that we have. Uh, so that's bias number one. Bias number two, um, I think that what is taking place in the electric power industry um, really is, when you get down to it, uh, an extension of deregulation that started in our industry in the mid-90s. Um, and I don't see it as something new, I just see it as the constant process that was unleashed with uh, deregulation, uh, particularly in California. Uh, and so, as a result, I think I tend to look at these as uh, kind of solvable problems. The pace is picking up and how things are going to change, uh, but I think these are all uh, reasonably solvable problems. A little bit about Edison. Uh, we have kind of two primary subsidiaries. One, Southern California Edison. Uh, it's a large uh, company, large utility, uh, about 50,000 square miles. We serve a population of around 14 million. Um, we have, uh, over the years, kind of moved uh, more and more towards focusing on uh, the distribution system, uh, part of the electric system. Uh, the other side of the business is uh, a kind of an amalgam of new businesses, new technologies. Uh, we're testing out a lot of things over there. Uh, very few of them actually make money. Uh, so this is one of the things I'll come back to talking about more. Uh, but as things are evolving and more quickly evolving, uh, basically I want to make sure that we're disrupting ourselves, that we are one of those companies that if this industry is going to be disrupted, we're going to have a place to be. The, uh, one of the thrills, I guess I'll put it that way, of working in the electric business is we actually provide an absolutely essential product uh, to society. Uh, you know, that hierarchy of needs, uh, water, food, shelter. In our modern society, uh, really none of those things are possible without electricity. So this is um, kind of a rare responsibility and a, uh, for us, I say a rare thrill to be involved in that type of a business. Um, I think that most of our people from the linemen uh, on up to the executive suite uh, in one way or another really have that sense of purpose that we are actually providing something that is absolutely essential to modern society. And it kind of gives people a, a thrill to be able to do that. Um, we try to manage that responsibility appropriately. So I want to talk mostly about change uh, and I think I'll even use the word disruption in the electric uh, power business. I see many things that are going to uh, continue to drive that, dis that disruption and that change. Um, I would probably put on the top of the list actually public policy. 
technology fights with that, uh, that number one position, but I think it's public policy that is mostly driving these changes. Uh, in California, uh, some of you may know this, but uh, been very active uh, trying to drive forward uh, a set of policies that will demonstrate for the world uh, that there is a way to move to a low carbon economy while at the same time providing for strong economic growth and job creation. And this is something that I would say literally from the governor, uh, I've had private conversations with him on this, he is absolutely passionate on this point, that global warming, uh, climate change is mankind's greatest problem. And he believes it will be that way for generations to come. Uh, so he's highly focused on trying to come up with the policies that will drive uh, to a low carbon economy. Not because fixing it in California is gonna fix it for the world, but that it will show the way or at least show some of the approaches that can work. Um, the legislature believes in that. The voting public believes in that. A threshold event for me was uh, in the depths of the great recession that we've been uh, working our way out of, uh, California had a ballot initiative. We're kind of famous for those things. But we had a ballot initiative that said, we would uh, table or stay, uh, delay implementing the climate change legislation that was passed in 2006, part of which is a cap and trade system and other parts. That would be stayed until unemployment fell to 5.5% for four consecutive quarters. And at the time, unemployment was 12.6% in California. And some of the counties that we serve in at Southern California Edison were over 15% unemployment. Uh, if ever there was a time for the voting public to have a choice between environmental stewardship, environmental responsibility, and economics, this was the time. That ballot initiative was voted down 62%. And for me, that was a real watershed event that um, this is not just uh, pie in the sky politicians or policymakers. This is uh, the broader electorate who is behind uh, trying to move to low carbon. I spent as much time on that because I, th I think in any of these endeavors to understand uh, kind of the underlying politics, if you will, the politics on the street is critical in order to kind of figure where these things are going. So certainly one of my takeaways is this is not a flash in the pan. Uh, this is not just about what's the lowest cost. Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this is a very durable uh, trend. Technology, uh, there are many of you in this room that know a lot more about that than I do. I'm not a scientist. Um, but it's amazing to me, and I think it's been amazing to many in our industry, just how rapidly uh, technologies have evolved, and very importantly, how those technologies have matured in a way to drive costs down. So what seemed uh, a fantasy uh, in terms of uh, solar generation or wind generation being competitive with fossil fuels, in our latest uh, energy procurement, we, we go through a big energy procurement process in the marketplace every year. Uh, nearly all, not some, nearly all of the bids that we got for uh, wind and solar came in at a lower price than natural gas fired plants. Uh, so this is really a watershed uh, event, I think. And technology is continuing to drive this process. Uh, one that's a little odd and frankly uneven, but uh, there's a lot of regulatory support for competition. Uh, so the notion that the utility will be uh, kind of the incumbent company, and it kind of owns the electric space. Uh, that's been eaten away at steadily by, uh, uh, by deregulation. Uh, really started probably 50, 60 years ago. We used to sell appliances uh, at Edison. That we, we had to get out of that business some time back. Uh, next one was generation. That was in the 80s and 90s. Uh, that's now become competitive. And more recently, with FERC Order 1000, the transmission piece is becoming competitive, although uh, that one's a little rockier at this point. Uh, so it really leaves the distribution system, 
the small wires, if you will, as the one part that is not um, uh, that is not under competition, that is somewhat of a natural monopoly. But I think that could very well change as well. Those three trends have produced another trend. I really think of it as an outcome, and that is uh, low to no growth in kilowatt hour sales. Uh, it's kind of an oddity of how the business is put together, but almost all the tariffs for all utilities are based on volume. Uh, so the more electricity you use, the bigger your bill. Kind of makes sense in some level. Uh, but in California, uh, the rates go up the more you use, which is completely the opposite of economics. Uh, and that's done really to promote, it's been done that way for 35 years now, it's done to promote uh, energy efficiency. So it's really a kind of a social engineering piece that's been dropped on top of uh, economics uh, in the electric business. But what I don't, uh, I do not see uh, much growth in kilowatt hour sales uh, nationally. I certainly don't in California. And I believe this is uh, probably one of the more arguable things I'll tell you. Uh, many of uh, my peers who might stand up here would probably argue against that proposition. Uh, but the way I see it is the move towards low carbon um, is going to require many more things to be electrified, particularly diesel-fired stationary applications. Think pumping water uh, out in uh, the Central Valley or something along that line. Uh, those will be replaced more and more with uh, electrification. Sounds like that should raise the amount of kilowatt hours used, and it will. However, offsetting that is we are just on the cusp of, I think, many uh, new technologies coming to the fore on how things are made, uh, the amount of material that's used, um, and therefore the amount of energy that is going to be used to, to manufacture those goods uh, so I see uh, that side as really just uh, early days. Energy efficiency with buildings and other things, uh, that's been around for a while. But again, I think the technologies are, are really ramping up uh, to have substantially more efficient use of energy. Um, so that will be a depressant on the amount of electricity used. And the final part is a little more inside baseball, but I believe that distributed energy resources think rooftop solar, things of that nature, are going to um, be on premise in homes, in businesses. And as that increases, the amount of electricity that those parties need from the utility is going to go down. So that's another depressant. The combination of energy efficiency writ large and uh, distributed generation is going to more than offset the amount of uh, things that get electrified in this move to a low carbon economy. Uh, one of those biases uh, showing through. Um, this has huge implications <clears throat> for our industry. Uh, I have to admit, I can't say for sure it's going to go that way, uh, but I want to use that planning assumption because if I'm wrong uh, and things, uh, we don't have that kind of flat to declining uh, kilowatt hour sales, or if things don't change as fast as I'm uh, kind of imagining they could, um, well, then we're just there a little bit earlier. Uh, however, if we assume things are going to go just fine and it's status quo and uh, we're the big incumbent uh, and I'm wrong, we'll be dead. Uh, so from my standpoint, from a planning assumption standpoint, that's the, the, the key way to go. Uh, one thing that I won't talk a lot about here unless it's something you're interested in from a Q&A standpoint, but uh, I think we have seen steady consolidation in the business. Um, we will see an acceleration and consolidation in the business. There are three brands of utilities out there, uh, investor-owned utilities. There are about 50 of those companies. Uh, they own about 70% of the assets and 70% of the customers. Uh, so about 50 of those. Municipal utilities or public power, there are about 2,000 of them, and there are about 1,000 co-ops. So that's a crazy system, frankly, uh, to have you know, a little over 3,000 entities providing electricity, most of them on a monopoly basis, uh, strikes me as something that's going to change. Um, I don't know that what I've described here is necessarily uh, 
I mean, it's about electricity, but I, I think most industries that you look at will be going through exactly the same type of uh, kind of dramatic change. So I'd like to spend just a few minutes on, well, what does this look like, this change look like in the electric system? Um, and I, we were talking about this upstairs. The traditional uh, kind of design uh, is to have big central plant pushing electrons out to homes and businesses. And that's been incredibly um, efficient, incredibly affordable, uh, and very durable. The kind of equipment that goes on that system is designed to be there for years and years. And I think it's been very effective. So we'll call that one-way flow of electricity, central plant to home and business. Uh, the meter is the dividing line. So from the meter up to the plant is the utility's responsibility, of course, from the meter out to the toaster uh, or the manufacturing process, the motors. Uh, that's the responsibility of the, of the customer. Uh, one of the things that I think is going to get really blurry uh, over the next five to ten years is where that line of responsibility ends. Uh, it's been that way where the meter is the dividing line for decades, uh, but a lot of things are starting to chew at that uh, so that utilities, I think, will certainly want to do more outside of the meter, beyond the meter, and many new entrants are going to want to do more inside the utility space. Uh, so this is going to be the battleground, uh, and it's almost like that World War I stuff, you know, where you would fight for long, long periods of time for a couple of hundred yards. It's going to be kind of the same game here, uh, right there at the meter. Distributed energy resources uh, kind of defined largely, so rooftop solar, storage, electric vehicles, uh, energy efficiency, uh, demand response programs, all those kinds of things I'm just going to lump together and call distributed energy resources. Uh, all of that is going on premise, and it's going typically beyond the meter, so not on the utility side of the meter. So of course now you have consumers who are also potentially producers. You have consumers who want to use their electricity that they're self-generating, but they also want to sell the excess if they have excess. Um, and this, I think, is one of the greatest uh, stimuli for uh, kind of this new order that I see. In an engineering standpoint, again, something I'm not on real firm ground uh, talking about, but uh, it's going to create two-way flows of electricity. And we're already seeing that in California. So a number of our circuits, we have 4,600 circuits at Southern California Edison, but a number of those circuits, particularly during uh, the kind of 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock period in the day, we're getting enough solar generation out at the home and business that it's pushing electricity back into the system all the way up to the transmission system in some instances. Uh, this is only going to become more prevalent as we get more distributed energy resources out there. Uh, so really huge from a power engineering standpoint. We have, I think, some really bright people working on this issue. Probably one of the most exciting parts uh, right now in the, in the business. Um, and I'll just say there's no map. Uh, so people are trying to figure out, well, what do you actually have to put on the system that allows it to manage these intermittent, we've had that before, but now two-way flows of electricity on the circuits. Uh, how do we ensure that one of those pillars of our kind of service pledge to our customers, reliability, how do we ensure that reliability is maintained when you have all of this going on in the electric system? Um, the other part that I want to talk a little bit about what this change means is with, uh, with customers. Um, if I want to be critical, I would say utilities have... Uh, you know, they've been blessed, they, they, get, uh, they get all these customers, they're, they're handed to them. Uh, they don't have to go out and try to market to them or figure out how to get them to like them. Uh, you know, we just have them. Uh, so in our case, as I mentioned, we serve a population of about 14 million people in Southern California. Uh, we didn't have to go out and fight for any one of those customers. We're really focused on how to make sure that our system is reliable and when we interact with the customer, that uh, if they have an outage, we can respond to that quickly and fix it. If they want electric service because they moved uh, into the territory or in a different place, 
we want to be able to respond to that quickly. So we're very focused on service, but we're not particularly focused on what does the customer want. It's real clear what they want. They want electricity and they get it the way we, we provide it. Uh, so we don't think a lot about what are their attitudes, what are their behaviors, uh, how is all that going to change over time. That's just not part of our, our usual way of thinking. That's going to change. Uh, I think that customers nowadays uh, have made it pretty clear that their tolerance for even a momentary outage which is interesting because we don't typically call momentary outages outages. It has to be out for five minutes for us to call it an outage. But everything in your house nowadays is digitized. And uh, whether it's the sprinkler system or it's just your alarm clock or whatever it may be, all that stuff's hooked up to a digital clock. And when you have even a momentary outage, you get to go around and reboot all of that stuff. Really big deal in a business. Uh, SpaceX is one of our uh, bigger customers in uh, Hawthorne. Uh, had a chance to spend time uh, with them. The manufacturing facility there is amazing. There is nobody on the assembly line. There are lots of engineers and they're working in clusters, but the actual assembly line that's making the rockets has no human on it. It's all robotic and it's all being managed with microprocessors and a momentary outage at SpaceX is a really bad event. Uh, that whole thing shuts down. They have to kind of redirect those engineers to reboot all of that and get it up and running. In some cases, uh, this is a type of thing that can be a three to five hour delay, uh, really expensive, not good. So power quality alone in our digitized world has become a much bigger deal than it used to be. That's one changing kind of attitude or behavior. Another is, uh, I kind of liken it to uh, show my age here, but music, I like music. Uh, used to go out and buy an album. Uh, there were probably two or three songs I really liked on there and the rest of it, you know, it was okay. But I didn't have a choice. I just bought the album. Um, newspaper, read one or two articles, maybe you read a couple of pages and you throw the newspaper away. Of course, all of that's changing. And I call it kind of uh, uh, individually customized. And that's the way people more and more are consuming and behaving. Um, that doesn't work the way we've got it set up in the electric system. You get it one way, our way. We're the, we're, the no, we're the ones who really know how it works. We're the ones who know what's best. And we provide the electricity to you in that one form. Um, if companies want higher power quality, you don't get it. By law, we have to provide it within a very, really tight tolerance on voltage and the like. Um, that isn't going to work as much in the future. I don't think consumers are going to want it one way. They're going to want to be more active in it. And I think these things are going to have more impact on the electric system than even some of the technology and some of the other pieces. Um, and for the utilities to be able to understand that and work with that is going to be critical. Just going to spend a minute on this, but uh, so our response to all of this is number one, we believe it's going to, or at least our planning assumption is it's going to change more radically. And number two, that we are going to uh, need to um, focus on the part that is what actually connects all the homes and businesses, connects all the customers. That's the distribution system, the small wires. Um, we have bet big on this. Uh, series of decisions we had to make, series of actions we took. Uh, we now only own 20% of the generation that's required to deliver the electricity to our customers. We buy 80%. We like that. We can use the competition of the marketplace to get the lowest prices. Uh, it gives us more flexibility. We can create a laddered portfolio just like you would in, a, in, in funding a company. We can create a laddered portfolio of uh, contracts for power. Uh, we can buy some on the spot market. We can buy some long term. Um, but we are focused on the distribution system. If we're wrong, it will not be a good day. But that's where we're, we're, we're really betting. Um, we think there are activities that will take place there that will need to upgrade that system dramatically, modernize it, mostly around uh, being more flexible and digitizing a lot of equipment on that system. 
tricky from a cybersecurity standpoint. We spend a lot of time on that side. The whole industry does, by the way. But this is where we're really uh, placing our bets. That's our core business. And today, if you kind of look at our capital, how we allocate capital, we invest in our core business. We invest about $4 billion every year in this electric system, almost all of it going to the distribution system. We invest or use capital to uh, pay dividends. Uh, we're a defensive industry. Um, so the stock market looks at us and says, ah, dividends, that's what we want. If you don't have a 3% yield or more, and more likely a 4% yield or more, they're, they're not uh, too excited about your capability for providing them a return. Um, between investing in the core business and investing in uh, giving capital back to our, uh, to our investors, that uses up pretty much all of our capital. Over the last four or five years, we've been putting more towards the disruptive businesses. So energy services for commercial and industrial customers. Uh, we think the C&I customers are going to be the ones that will disintermediate most quickly uh, from this system in the new world. Um, we're looking at things uh, on the water side, uh, mostly trying to use the distribution model. So just like distributed energy resources, but uh, for water applications. Uh, we're looking at using our fiber optic network in different ways. Uh, so. Um, kind of building on uh, the infrastructure theme uh, and other electrification pieces uh, that potentially would be disru disruptive. So it's kind of a barbell strategy, uh, but the key piece in the middle is the tension point with investors. Uh, how much patience do they have for us putting capital to um, uh, disruptive businesses, investing in disruptive businesses versus uh, giving them a, a higher dividend than what we currently do. So I mentioned I would uh, just kind of ping the uh, kind of six big items that we keep looking at uh, that I think are going to be kind of central in this discussion. Um, I don't have the answers, but one of them is, is this going to go more and more distributed energy resources or is this going to remain more central plant oriented. That's probably one of the biggest debates in the industry right now. Uh, and not too surprisingly, the folks who have a lot of big central plants uh, tend to think that's the way it should go. And uh, those who don't have a lot of central plants, that would be us, uh, tend to think it goes more the distributed energy resource side. Frankly, I think the reality is it's gonna be both, but how these things integrate and really where the, where the growth is uh, I'm at least fairly confident that the growth will be on the distributed side, not on the bulk power side. Um, second one is, uh, is it all about lowest cost or is it something else? Um, the whole industry for decades has been focused on trying to deliver electricity reliably and cheaply. Um, it's hard for any of us to walk away from that, uh, but... Uh, other value propositions may uh, be in there, not the least of which, how much are people willing to pay for um, reducing carbon? Uh, in various environmental uh, values that they see. There's a whole slew of externalities, and uh, at the same time, a third of our customers are uh, requiring some sort of bill assistance in order to um, pay their electric bills. So we can't rock, walk away from affordability, but there are a lot of other issues. Um, the role of incentives and mandates from government, um, or should this be much more of a free market type of process? Of course, central to that debate is should you have a carbon cap and trade or a carbon tax or some sort of method for pricing, uh, pricing carbon? But I think the role of incentives going forward and how much is too much, when should those be backed off? Uh, when should the cross subsidies be reduced? Uh, fourth one, uh, it's kind of odd perhaps, but I think the current skepticism that's uh, been growing uh, probably since the uh, financial meltdown about uh, capitalism and the ability for uh, free enterprise to solve these problems or are these problems that require uh, the government to solve them. Um, again, my hope would be that it's uh, a collaboration as opposed to one or the other um, but doesn't take too much um, 
creativity to think in terms of uh, some of the things we're seeing in the current election cycle are certainly tapping into this concern that large corporations uh, are not doing the job that's required. Uh, and I think this certainly shows up in our, in our industry. Um, managing an old line company. Um, we've been around 130 years. Uh, we've had a huge number of firsts on the engineering side, um, but how do we manage this company in a very uh, disruptive and changing environment? Um, all the way down to that whole thing about dividends and what do our investors want from us? Uh, and then the final one I often get asked, what, are, um, what keeps you up at night? And what keeps me up at night, oddly, is we're a capital intensive business. We're used to investing billions of dollars. We do that every year. And when we invest those dollars, we invest it in hard assets, equipment that sits on a system. And we get recovery 30, 40, 50 years. Some of the recovery periods for some of our transmission components is actually 70 years. I don't know what in this world is going to be around for 50 years, much less 70 years, uh, with the degree of change that we have. So this managing a capital-intensive business in a fast-changing world is, uh, I think, a, a significant item. So those are a few things that we're uh, stewing on. Maybe uh, you all have some of those answers as well. I guess at this point, I'd be happy to take any, um, any questions that you have. Yes, sir. I'm Ben Roderick, I'm second year. I worked at a utility company here this summer. I know that the uh, distributed generation issue is one of the things that they're dealing with as well. So I was wondering how you see public policy changing in response to it. So some states are trying to tax uh, home solar panels. Others think that utilities will just start getting a grant from the government, like federal government, to do as much as they can with it. It will reward the most efficient producers. So where do you think policy? Yeah, it, it's wide open. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, I think it's probably one of those uh, can't give you a good answer. I, I do believe that it will vary a lot by states. <clears throat> so some states that have um, coal uh, or fossil fuels uh, as a big part of their economy, uh, they're not going to be too excited about uh, really dramatically promoting uh, distributed energy resources because by their very nature they compete with those, those core resources. Some states have a terrific wind regime, uh, but not so great on the solar. Uh, on and on it goes. So I think you'll have different states responding in different ways. And the one part that's unique, distributed energy resources sit on the distribution system. That's um, the jurisdiction uh, that has responsibility for the rules around that is the state. So in our case, it's California Public Utilities Commission. So that means every state has uh, kind of the ability to set the rules differently. Um, the bulk power system, so transmission, big central plant, that's all uh, the jurisdiction of FERC. So that's a federal energy policy. And there are, there are going to be some really interesting battles shaping up uh, over the next few years that will be kind of federal versus state, FERC versus PUCs. We're seeing that uh, really already with a lot of uh, how you're going to handle demand response and those types of things. But in recent conversations with the commissioners at FERC, they're very tuned into this issue. So there isn't a one-size-fits-all. Uh, that's the, the best answer I can give you. Yes. And in terms of customer choice, where do you see community choice aggregation? in California, and what's the role of the utility? Yeah. You guys know a lot about electricity. <laughs> so community choice aggregation, um, one of the best examples in our territory is uh, kind of the Lancaster-Palmdale area. And uh, the, the mayor uh, has made a really big issue out of this. And you know, we're going to go get our own uh, renewable resources. Uh, mostly solar is what they're looking at there. They're kind of in the Mojave Desert. Um, and my response is, usually surprises most people on that. I'm all for it. Uh, again, we want to be in the delivery business. Uh, we want to be in the network business. <clears throat> uh, we want to do other things too, but that's the core of it. Uh, my choice is either I'm going to provide the 20-year contract 
to support uh, a development out in the, in the Mojave Desert somewhere where I put up my balance sheet, it impacts my credit rating, and I get zero compensation for it. Or have at it. You can go do all that yourself. It means I don't have to buy the power. I don't have to use my balance sheet. I'm not making any money off of that anyway. So from my standpoint, from a straight financial business, I, I have no issue with it. I think the bigger issues are probably sleepers in there, and that is how well can each community go out and source uh, the power. I don't think it's the most efficient way. Um, I think ultimately customers are not going to get the greatest shake out of it. Again, from my standpoint, my selfish standpoint, I'm all for it, no problem. I, I just think it has, uh, you don't get the economies of scale and you don't get the expertise to do that. Uh, my guess is it will not last for a long period of time. Yes. Hi, uh, Woodrow Simmons from the Energy Science Technology and Policy <coughs> Program. Uh, you mentioned earlier that uh, the prices for solar and wind were cheaper than, than for natural gas. Okay. Do you take into account the price that you have to pay for the intermittency and non dispatchability of those two sources? Well, in these procurements, no. Um, we don't load additional cost into that. We are simply looking at the energy component. Uh, we do have other procurements where we will do procurement for firm. Uh, so then either they have to provide that or we load in some cost for that. Uh, but in the ones I, I was talking about, these are just straight up energy procurements. Um, and that's saying something. I mean, seven cents is kind of the rough rule of thumb um, for what uh, you know, natural gas fired, new natural gas fired generation levelized cost of energy. Um, and this is coming in appreciably below that. Yeah, but this, is, this means that the uh, integration of renewable <coughs> sources is going to cost you a lot. So don't you think that that cost should be somehow input into the tariff? Yeah, and then the argument on the other side is, don't you think there are benefits that come from using renewable resources? This is called a big sinkhole. <laughs> you can fall into this hole forever. Uh, trying to understand what those um, puts and takes are is one of the things that uh, I hope over the next 6 to 12 months that uh, our company, along with Con Ed in New York, and uh, the New York PSC and the California PUC uh, are going to try to answer this question in terms of distributed energy resources, which are different than these. These are all bulk power resources I was talking about. Uh, but what is the value of distributed energy resources? And it's, it will be another stake in the ground. It will not be the definitive answer for sure. But I think most policymakers uh, in the states that are active in these areas have tended to look at this as they kind of net themselves out. The societal benefits, the environmental benefits, so on and so forth, are about equivalent to um, the cost of intermittency or managing a more complex system. And certainly in California, that's where they've come. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Ian Sullivan. I'm a first year MBA. It seems like one of the toughest decisions SCE has had to make recently was to close the San Onofre plant. Yeah. So I was wondering if you could just talk about how you know, your thought process was as, as the company went through that. Yeah, well, that would take another hour. <clears throat> uh, and you've probably already noticed I'm not great on short answers. But, uh, uh, you know, that's one of those where at the end of the day, I'd have to say it. I really felt strongly that one was on me. And the decision to uh, shut it down as opposed to continue to keep trying to work through the, with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to maybe someday get a yes or a no. We were burning uh, just about a million dollars a day, a day, to keep that option alive. And um, I ultimately looked at it as we, I don't know if we'll ever get a yes or no. <clears throat> and I would have taken either, but I don't know if I'll ever get a yes or no. And most certainly if it's yes, you can restart uh, unit two. You're going to uh, encounter all kinds of uh, lawsuits from uh, NRDC and the others that were involved, Friends of the Earth and so on, that were involved in this. And that could go for another year or two. Uh, and I just saw it as 
there's a crossover point here where uh, you cannot continue to keep this option alive and pay that. Uh, we can't plan around it. We don't know whether it's in or it's out. Uh, and uh, we only had eight years left on that license and we didn't have a license renewal. We'd have to go get a license renewal. The cost of all of those things you can kind of you know, put into a, a reasonable model. And it basically said at the end of that year um, that we made the decision, we would kind of hit that crossover point, give or take a few months. Uh, so in June, uh, I just said, we're done. And, uh, and we pulled the plug. So that's, you know, it's not easy. Uh, we had 3,000 employees. Uh, we had communities that really uh, relied, interestingly, relied on the tax receipts, relied on the economic uh, activity, a lot of issues involved in there. But you know, every once in a while, you, you have those kinds of decisions you have to make. So th those are some of the considerations. Uh, we have time for one more question. Can it be an outside? Well, must be from Whoever <laughs> you mentioned such important issues, uh, such as uh, climate change. Yes. And would you say something to us about the global issues that connect us in America? We have students from all over the world, and the next generation is here, and they have to deal with things we have not done. And when you go in with us to India or to China, maybe you could tell us what your recommendation would be. Yeah. Um, I maybe move over one spot on answering that question. Uh, I think the way we look at it, uh, the way I look at it is um, most of the most complex things in life are about trade-offs and trying to get the balance right. Uh, you know, the old, there's not much black and there's not much white. There's a whole lot of gray. Uh, I think the, the issues that are at play here are huge. The potential impacts are huge, but it's still a matter of some level of balancing. And of course, you're operating with less than perfect information. My basic view is uh, what our customers want and what the people in California want, I won't speak for the whole world, but what they want is they want a company that's going to figure out how to do this. They want us to address climate change they don't understand all the pieces. They don't understand exactly what our contribution is to it and all that, but they keep it simple and they want us to address it and they want us to address it in a way that doesn't kill the economy. They don't know exactly those trade-offs, but they know what they want. And I view it as it's our responsibility, our core responsibility to come up with those answers. Uh, I think we're actually in one of the better places to do that because we know kind of how the system works. We know what some of those fine balance points are. Um, this has been a really big debate point within the industry. I would say uh, the industry, in my opinion, has been a little slow on just standing up and embracing the point. We will come up with the solutions. We don't know what they all are yet, but we are in one of the best positioned to do it, and we will come up with the solutions. Uh, there are a lot of people we're going to have to work with, but I'm at least one who's optimistic that we can do that. Um, one last piece, in California, we have one of the highest personal tax rates. We had a $23 billion deficit. We had a cap and trade system. I think most people would look at those things and say, wow, California's really screwed up. Um, today, uh, that deficit is now a surplus, a $2 billion surplus. Unemployment has come down to the national average, which we'd like it to be lower, but it's down to the national average. The economic growth rate in California has been a half a percent to a full percent better for the last three years than the national average GDP. Um, and we've done that with all those, those things. So I think the big question is, is that sustainable? Can we keep moving that forward? Uh, but it at least gives me some hope that uh, we actually can get the balance right to be able to address the climate change issues and uh, keep the economy vibrant as well. So it's a big job, and it's one of the things that uh, kind of gets me up every morning is the excitement to actually tackle that. So maybe I should leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you.